and with that, we will officially get started with Brian Sauter, our Executive Director at Faith in Place. Thank you for kicking us off. DJ Antonio Caesar, come on everybody, give some love to DJ Antonio Caesar in the chat. So great for you, for you to set the tone, the vibe for us as we kick off the 2022 Green Team Summit. My name is Reverend Brian Sauter. I'm the Executive Director of Faith in Place and it is my great joy to officially welcome you here to the 2022 Green Team Summit. We're just so thrilled and excited to spend four days together. But before we get started though, I'm gonna turn it over real quick to Elena Candler, our Deputy Director for Instructions, how to join this great event through Spanish. Elena? Thank you, Brian. Hola, buenas noches a todos y bienvenidos. Me llamo Elena Candler y soy la Subdirectora de Faith in Place. Hoy tenemos interpretación disponible en español. Si usted quiere escuchar en español, por favor, haga clic en interpretación en el menú de Zoom abajo. El botón parece un globo. Después, haga clic en español. Para escuchar solo en español, haga clic en silenciar audio original. Muchísimas gracias. And Brian, back to you. Thank you so much, Elena. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited. I'm seeing everybody in the chat. We have everything coming together. This is a big year for our summit as we're welcome Dr. Catherine Hayhoe as our keynote speaker tonight. We're very excited to have her with us. We're gonna be exploring through the next few days our theme of Rooted Together. This is a theme that's gonna anchor all of our explorations throughout the week together for our 2022 Green Team Summit. I wanna thank each of you for being here with us and I wanna give a big shout out. There's watch parties, in-person watch parties that are happening across this country where people are coming together at a house of worship in person to enjoy and be a part of our big community here for our Green Team Summit. I do wanna take a moment to recognize everyone who made this session possible. Faith in Place is part of a national network called Interfaith Power and Light. And this year was especially excited as we joined together with two other affiliates, Hoosier Interfaith Power and Light and Wisconsin Interfaith Power and Light. And now we're working as Faith in Place as one organization across the three states of Illinois, Wisconsin, and Indiana. We want to give a huge shout out to all the Interfaith Power and Light affiliates that came together to help support this Green Team Summit, as well as over 20 national organizations who officially joined to partner with us on this amazing event. You can find out more about our partners through our partners page link that's available to you in the chat. I also want to thank our sponsors who made this evening possible, especially our headline sponsor, big shout out NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. You can find out more about their powerful work at their website, nrdc.org. And I'd also like to acknowledge ComEd, an excellent company as a session sponsor, as well as the Congregation of St. Joseph, Create More Karma Foundation, Gazerio and Thule, and the Illinois Environmental Council. All right, so now at this time, I want to turn the floor over to Isioma Odom, who will share a welcoming invitation. Isioma. Good evening, everyone. I'm Isioma Odom, Faith in Places Chicago Senior Outreach Coordinator. And I would like to thank the Cultural Health and Leadership for Racial Justice for this welcoming. Welcome to people of all genders. This may include people who identify as women, men, transgender, queer, or others, people of African descent, people of African-American descent, Black American descent, Asian descent, Arab descent, European descent, those who identify as Hispanic, Latinx, people indigenous to this land, and people of mixed and multiple descendants. We'd like to welcome languages spoken here, Spanish, English, indigenous languages, sign languages, people of different class backgrounds, working class, middle class, owning class, are who aren't sure, where they fit on the class spectrum. People who currently struggle with getting access to resources necessary for survival, like healthcare, adequate healthcare, reliable transportation, and, ch and childcare, and people who currently have more access to those resources, we welcome you. People with disabilities, visible or invisible, gay, lesbian, bisexual, heterosexual, pansexual, queer, are others from whom none of these labels fit, we welcome your bodies and the different ways you experience yours. Survivors and people who identify as activists and people who don't, 
single, married, partnered, dating, and monogamous or polyamorous relations. Those in their teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Your emotions, joy and bliss, grief, rage, indignation, contentment, disappointment. Those who support you to be here, your families, genetic and otherwise, people with different faiths, religious traditions, faith practices, and private practices, or don't belong to any tradition, who are agnostic or atheist seekers and spiritualists, those who are dear to us who have passed away, and we welcome our elders, those here in this room, in our lives, and in those who guide us in the spirit realm. Yes, and finally, I'd like to welcome the ancestors who lived on this land where we are now. I welcome the spirits of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi, the natives who lived on this area, or lived in this area before the Europeans came. Now, I would like to turn it over to Jenny Judd for our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Isioma. Welcome everyone. I'm Ginny Judd, Faith and Places Operations and Finance Director, and I'm pleased to share with you a land acknowledgement honoring the ancestral heritage of the land on which I stand this evening. I'm calling from what is today known as Glen Ellen, Illinois. This land has a history we do not fully know nor comprehend. We wish to acknowledge and thank all the indigenous peoples and nations who inhabited this land for many thousands of years before us for their care, respect, and attention given to this ground that we now stand on. In more recent history, before European, before European peoples arrived, this was the land of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi, who are also known as the Council of Three Fires. Others such as the Sioux, Kickapoo, Peoria, Miami, Sauk, Fox, and Illinois also settled on and moved through this land. The people of these tribes cared for this land as stewards of the rivers, the wildlife, and the plants which flourished. They inhabited villages in the area, including those in what are now known as Churchill Woods and the Morton Arboretum. Let us pause for a moment, and I invite you to drop in the chat where you are calling from and the ancestral heritage of that land. You can use the link Native Land to begin answering questions about whose land you reside on and how you are benefiting by living on this land that is the traditional territory of Indigenous people. We also have a page on our website linked in the chat with podcasts, books, videos, organizations, and more to help you learn about the history of the people Indigenous to the land where we live. This acknowledgement from Faith in Place demonstrates a commitment to continue the process to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. We acknowledge these Native nations are still present among us and that we as a team are learning about the true history of our land. Our aim is to become a vibrant, inclusive community with environmental justice at the core of our efforts. Now, I would like to introduce Reverend Scott Anque, who will introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Katherine Hagel. Thank you, Jenny. And without further ado, I am excited to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening, Dr. Katherine Hagel. As many of you already know, Dr. Hagel is an atmospheric scientist who studies climate change, one of the most pressing issues facing humanity today. But Catherine may be best known to many people because how she bridges the broad, deep gap between scientists and Christians. Work she does in part because she's a Christian herself. She is a remarkable communicator who has received the American Geophysical Union Climate Communication Prize, the Stephen Schneider Climate Communication Award, the United Nations Champion of the Earth Award, and has been named to a number of lists, including Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, Foreign Policy's 100 Leading Thinkers, and Fortune Magazine's World's Greatest Leaders. Her TED Talk, The Most Important Thing You Can Do to Fight Climate Change, Talk About It, has nearly 4 million views, 
and is an incredibly helpful tool for communities of faith wondering how to address a problem as large as climate change. She is the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy and a distinguished professor and chair at Texas Tech University. Tonight, Dr. Hayhill will be sharing about her most recent book, Saving Us, a climate scientist case for hope and healing in a divided world. You can find the link to that book in our chat. After Dr. Hayhill shares, we will have time for live question and answers. You can submit your questions throughout her talk through the question answer button at the bottom of the screen. Dr. Hayho, we are truly honored. You can join us tonight and the stage is all yours. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be with you all here today to see all the different places people are coming from, including where I live in Texas, including my home country of Canada, and using the wonderful Native Lands uh, program that I use myself to figure out where whose lands we're actually living on. So let me share my screen with you. And we are going to begin. We are going to be doing this a little interactively. If you've been to a presentation of mine before, you've probably seen this. Um, I want you to go ahead and I've put the link in the chat as well. So you can click on the link in the chat or you can type it in your computer or you can even take a picture with your phone and join the discussion at pollev.com slash Catherine. The only tricky part is if you're typing it in because you have to make sure you get the two A's in Catherine. So join me online at pollev.com slash Catherine and I'm going to ask you a question. And that question, you have to answer with one word, not two words, just one word. Ready? That question is, how do you feel about climate change in one word? How do you feel about climate change? I've asked this question of people across the US, across Canada, around the world. I've asked school children, university students, senior citizens. I've asked people of faith and people who are not of faith. I've asked business leaders and community groups. And wherever I go, whoever I'm talking to, I get the exact same answers that you've put here. This is the way we feel. We feel concerned worried, scared, anxious, depressed, overwhelmed. And if you feel that way, you are not alone. The vast majority of people actually feel this way. Not only that, but this is a very normal and natural and I would say rational way to feel when we're confronted with what's happening to our world. When you actually see what's happening to the planet and what humans are doing, it is completely rational to feel scared, anxious, worried, concerned. In fact, that is the most normal reaction we could possibly have. So before I go into why that is and what we can do about it, I want to share something else with you. And that is the fact that we're not actually doing questions in the Zoom q and I'm sorry for that. We're doing questions right here. And so what you can do as we go along is at any point you can put your questions in here but here's the fun part. You can upvote other people's questions. So when we get to the end, we're going to have an open Q&A, but I'm depending on you to upvote the questions that you are most interested in getting the answers to. Okay, so at any point, if you have a question, go put it in Poly V and upvote the questions you most want us to discuss at the end. So why should we feel concerned and worried? It's because we truly are conducting an unprecedented experiment with our home. We've never seen this much carbon going into the atmosphere this quickly, as far back as we can go in the history of the planet. And not only that, but we've known about this science for a long time. We've known since the 1850s, the digging up and burning coal back then and oil and gas today and burning it produces heat trapping gases that are building up in the atmosphere, essentially wrapping an extra blanket around the planet, causing it to warm. We've known this since the 1850s. 
But what we know today that we didn't realize back then is how profoundly it impacts every aspect of life on this planet. It quite literally affects the quality, the nutritional content, and the availability of the food that we eat, as well as the food that many other living species depend on. Climate change actively affects the quantity and quality of the water that we need, not just to drink, but to uh, water our crops and for other things, as well as the water that other living things need. Climate change and burning fossil fuels literally affects the air we breathe. Did you know that burning fossil fuels produces so much air pollution that it's responsible for 10 million premature deaths every year? That's double the number of COVID every year from breathing in the pollution from burning fossil fuels. And climate change affects every aspect of our society as humans because we have built our entire society, our buildings, our roads, our water systems, our food systems, our supply chains, our electricity systems. We have built everything that we have for a planet that no longer exists. And that is why we are seeing such devastating impacts from the extreme heat and extreme drought as climate change loads the weather dice against us. The way I think of it is we always have a chance of rolling a double six on our weather dice, naturally a heat wave, a drought, a wildfire, a hurricane, a storm, a flood. But today climate change is loading those dice against us. We're throwing six after six after six, and then all of a sudden we're throwing some sevens and even an eight. We're saying, how did this even happen? We didn't used to have those numbers on our dice. That's the biggest way that climate change is affecting us, taking our extremes and making them more intense, more damaging, more dangerous. And all you have to do is pick up the newspaper or read the news headlines almost every single day this summer and you will see it. Flooding in Chicago was the headline today. The, flo the, the flooding in, in Jackson and the fact that they have in many places still no water last week. The fact that we had five 1,000 year flood events in five weeks in the US alone. And then let's talk about Pakistan. Over 30 million people displaced by those floods. The record breaking drought in China, the drought, the heat wave, and then the floods in the EU and the UK. Wherever we look, we are seeing real people being affected today by the impacts of a changing climate. And that's why it's really important to realize that it is not about saving the planet or saving people. It's not about the economy or the environment. When we couch this as the environment or saving the planet as opposed to other things that we care about, we're setting up an innate conflict that prevents forward momentum. What do I mean by it's not about saving the planet? Well, literally this planet will be orbiting the sun long after we are gone. What's at risk from what we're doing, most at risk is us, us 8 billion people who have built our civilization for a planet that no longer exists. And right up there with us are many of the world's most vulnerable species. Unchecked, climate change could lead to a 30% extinction by the end of the century. It's us living things. It's not the economy or the environment. It's either both together or neither. It's not people or the planet. It's either all living things together or none of it. And that might sound like a nuance and it might not sound too important to you, but it's actually really important because we have to start where people are, not where we want them to be. And that's not easy. We always want people to start where we are, right? But we have to start where they are if we're gonna have positive constructive conversations about this issue. Now, climate change affects all of us, but it does not affect us equally. Those who have done the least to contribute to the problem, those who have produced virtually no, almost no carbon emissions, no heat trapping gas emissions, the poorest 50% of people in the world who produce 7% of emissions, they are the ones who are most impacted by a changing climate. We're all affected, but people who are already marginalized, who are already vulnerable, they are the ones who are affected the most women and children, especially in low income countries, indigenous peoples who have often lost so much, so many of the rights to their land already. People of color who live in low income neighborhoods that are more at risk from extreme heat, from flooding, from poor air quality and from climate change. Wherever we look, we see people today are already being impacted and it is not fair. 
When we look globally, we see the tremendous financial disparity between the high income and the low income countries. The high income countries, of course, being responsible for the majority of the problem. The US itself has produced almost 30% of the heat trapping gas emissions that are causing climate change all by itself. Yet as climate changes, the economic gap between the richest and poorest countries in the world has already increased already. So from the 1960s till today, it has increased by 25% from the poorest to the richest countries. And just before COVID hit, the United Nations announced that climate change threatens to undo the last 50 years of development, global health and poverty reduction. And of course, COVID has interacted with that, making it even worse. Climate change is, as the US military calls it, a threat multiplier. In other words, it takes all of the threats that already exist and it makes them worse. Poverty, hunger, lack of access to resources, lack of basic health care, basic education, a safe place to live, lack of a voice, lack of ability to make a difference, lack of a safe home. All of these things are exacerbated by the impacts of a changing climate. So it's true that climate change affects us all, but it's also true that it affects those who've contributed the least the most, and that isn't fair. So how do we respond to this? Often we think that me and everybody I know, everybody who answered that question that I asked at the beginning, how do you feel about climate change? Me and most of the people I know were worried, we think. But we're only the tiny minority. Most people are not worried because they never want to talk about it. This is what we think. And so because of that, we often think if they just knew how bad it was, surely they'd spring into action. And this is actually a little image from one of our global weirding series that you can find on YouTube. If I just load up my wheelbarrow with all the scary facts about Antarctica melting and the doomsday glacier and the polar bears and the sea level rise, and if I just dump it on them, surely that will get them to act. So climate changes and we get worried and we load up with all our really true and accurate scary facts and we share them with people and what happens? If you've done this, you probably have a few times, I certainly have myself, you know that it didn't usually yield the result you wanted. Why is that? Why did people just turn off even more? Why did no action result? It turns out that our brains, literally our brains, are not wired to respond to fear unless we know what we personally can do about it. Tally Sherrod is a neuroscientist. She wrote a really interesting book called The Influential Mind that has nothing to do with climate change, but on the other hand, I feel like it has everything to do with climate change. And one of the things she said as a neuroscientist, speaking about just our brains in general, is fear and anxiety cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than take action. And I would add, if we don't know what to do. Now you may say, well, I do know what to do. Reduce plastic waste, recycle, eat more plants. I had a woman approach me a little while ago who said, you know, I've been so careful all my life. I have recycled. I use no plastic whatsoever. You could fit all of my plastic waste in a small sandwich baggie by the end of the year. And she said, but then I ended up in the hospital. I had a heart problem and thankfully she's fine now. But she said, in three days at the hospital, they created and wasted more plastic taking care of me than I had used in my entire life. And then she said, what is the point of what I'm doing? Have I just wasted my entire life? We're very careful with how we travel. And then we hear that there's 3,000 empty flights running just to keep their gate assignments. We do everything we can to eat carefully, and then we see all the food waste, a whole 90,000 person stadium full of food waste is produced every day, which then decays, producing heat trapping gases. And we think, why even bother? So they, we can bother and we can make a difference, but we have to begin by realizing that our picture of the world this picture that we have a small group of people who are worried and then a lot of people who aren't, this picture of the world is not accurate. The real picture of the world is this. And you might say, oh, well, that's the world, that's not the US. Actually, this is the US. If, if for the world, worried is even bigger. It turns out that most people are worried. 
there's a small group that aren't worried, but I would argue that even most of that small group is pretty much suppressing it because they don't want to do anything about it. But there's only a small group that are activated. In fact, let me give you the actual statistics here. In the United States, as of last year, I would venture to say that the numbers are probably higher this year after this summer, but last year, 70% of Americans were worried about climate change already, 70%. 86% of young people are worried. 83% of mothers are worried. But half feel hopeless, helpless, and don't know where to start. And get this, only 8% are activated. Only 8%. So clearly, it isn't about making people worried is going to guarantee they act, because if being worried was the only prerequisite for acting, we would have 70% of people acting. But we don't. The biggest gap we have is between the people who are worried and the people who are not acting. How do we bridge that gap? By tackling the two biggest real problems people have. Not that they aren't worried, but that they don't understand why it matters so urgently to them here and now, and we don't understand what we can do to fix it. Now you might say, well, surely everybody understands why it matters so urgently. Let me show you some data. Some data that illustrates something that psychologists call psychological distance. We humans are really good at psychological distance because it's a defense mechanism when we can't bear the anxiety without knowing what to do about it. So we shove off our problems to, oh, I'll worry about that later. I'll worry about my retirement savings later. I'll worry about what I'm really supposed to be eating later. I'll worry about that later. Or it's far away from me. It's not going to happen to me here. It's only going to happen to those people over there. Or it's just this abstract issue, not a concrete issue. Or it doesn't matter to me. So when we look across the whole United States, we say, do you think global warming is real? Most people say yes. Any county that's orange means more than 50% of people said yes. And the darker orange it is, the more people said yes. And then if you ask people, do you think it will affect plants and animals? Now, how is this psychological distance? It's non-human species. So not me, but plants and animals. Yes, it's real, it'll affect plants and animals. Will it affect future generations, people in the future? Yes. How about people who live over there? People in developing countries? Well, we're a bit lighter here, but it's still mostly orange. And then the Yale researchers, this is from the Yale program on climate communication, the Yale researchers asked this question. Do you think it will affect you? Look at that. It's mostly blue. There's a few orange areas, and if you're curious about those orange areas, it turns out that Hispanic Catholics and Native Americans are two of the most concerned people groups about climate change. You might say, well, of course, Hispanic Catholics because of the Pope, right? Well, it turns out white Catholics are actually neck and neck at the very bottom tied with white evangelical Protestants for the least concerned. It just goes to show. It's not religious lines this falls out along. It is entirely ideology. In fact, the number one predictor of whether people agree with 150 years of science saying climate is changing, humans are responsible, the impacts are serious, is simply where we fall on the political spectrum. That is it. But there's one more map here that's even darker blue. What do you think that is? Do you ever talk about it? Do you ever talk about it? And the answer pretty much is no. Most people, okay, Seattle, you're doing all right, but that's a pretty light orange there. Also San Francisco again, doing okay, but a pretty light orange. Do you ever talk about it? What's the connection? If you don't talk about it, why would you care? And if you don't care, why would you do anything about it? You can be worried about the polar bears, about the Antarctic ice sheet, about you know, the future of, the, of, of civilization, but if you don't understand how it affects you, where you live, then there's no reason to prioritize action. I was in Iowa a couple of months ago virtually. I do almost all my talks virtually, even before COVID. And somebody there asked a great question. They said, well, 
okay, but how do I talk about the polar bears in Iowa? And so I said to them, I said, well, unless there's a population of polar bears in Iowa that I don't know about, you don't. What you talk about is what matters. Talk about the corn harvest, talk about the wind energy potential, talk about the crazy floods they've had in Iowa. Talk about what matters to you where you live today, not a hundred years in the future, here where you live, not up at the Arctic, unless you live in the Arctic, in which case then yes, do talk about that and talk about what matters to you and to them. And you might say, well, how do I know what matters to them? There's an easy way to find out. You ask and you listen. The best conversations begin with asking questions and listening very carefully to the answers. When I was recording the audio version to Saving Us um, just over a year ago, I was in the studio over a weekend in August with just me and the sound engineer in Lubbock, Texas, which is the second most conservative city in the whole US, the number one being Provo, Utah. And I will be speaking at Provo, Utah in a couple of months at Brigham Young University. And after I had done the first couple of hours, I walked out of the studio to sort of rest my voice. And the sound engineer said to me, I didn't realize your book was about climate change. I have some questions. And I knew what that meant. <laughs> so I said, okay, sure. So I sat down, but before he started asking me questions, I started asking him questions. How long have you lived here? Oh, almost all my life. So, you know, you got family here. Oh yes, told me all about his family. So what do you enjoy doing? Oh, well, I grew up going fishing and I always went fishing and now I took my son and now I'm looking forward to taking, you know, my, my grandsons. But, and so I said, oh, so have you noticed any changes? Oh, the water's so much warmer. There's algae, there's all kinds of pollution. I said, yeah, I totally understand. You know, what else? Oh, well, we always grew up going skiing in New Mexico. I said, oh, we do too. We love skiing in New Mexico. He said, but yeah, now there's hardly any snow. And you know, I said, yeah, I remember two years ago, they didn't even have a season because it was so warm and it's so dry, it didn't even snow. So before he knew it, he was telling me why he cared about climate change. <laughs> and I was just agreeing with him. And so then I connected the dots. I said, you know, this is happening everywhere. And then, the conversation immediately pivoted to the second half of what we're talking about, which is, he said, okay, but how do you fix it without ruining the economy? And we got to start talking about solutions. So let's go there next. It turns out that people are willing to change if they feel something that scientists call efficacy. Now that's a fancy word, but it has a very simple meaning. Do you think what you do can make a difference? If you don't think it can make a difference, why do it, right? So that poor woman who'd been, you know, not using plastic all her life, or the people who are very careful with how they travel, like me, and then you hear about how these all, all these flights just running with empty seats just to keep their gate assignments, it erodes our efficacy. We have a stunning lack of efficacy because we have been focusing most of our actions on what? On what we can do in our personal lives. And don't get me wrong, and I say this again, don't get me wrong, because I've been gotten wrong many times. Don't get me wrong. Personal actions matter. Living according to our values and beliefs and standards are important to ourselves, and they are also important to other people around us. If you follow me, you know that every year I pick up two new habits, whether it's taking plastic out of the bathroom or buying a plug-in car. If you also follow me, you probably know I have a newsletter. If you haven't signed up for it, you can just go to my website, katherinehayhoe.com and sign up for the newsletter. And every week there's something you can do. But you'll notice that interspersed among things we can do personally is always the encouragement to share that information with others and a lot of information on what we can do to be, in the words of Bill McKibben, not such an individual. How does an individual change a system? Because we have to change the system. Even if every single person did everything they could to reduce their personal emissions, that wouldn't even take care of a quarter of the problem. So how do we change the system by not being such an individual, by engaging with the system? And when we look around at what's happening, we see that that giant boulder of climate action is not sitting at the bottom of an impossibly steep cliff with only a few hands on it. So David Attenborough, maybe Greta Thunberg, and you know, a couple of people from Faith in Place, not at all. That boulder is already at the top of the hill. It's already rolling down the hill in the right direction. It has millions of hands on it. And if you add yours and 
if you use your voice to encourage others to add theirs, it will go faster. How do you think a company ever decides to make a change? It's because somebody used their voice to say, hey, maybe we should do this. And you know, nine out of 10 times, it is not the CEO who said that. How do you think a church ever decides to make a difference or a place of worship? It's because one person opened their mouth or wrote something and said, let's think about how we could have a community garden, do an energy audit, put solar panels on the roof and make it a community garden, how we could, how we could do something together. And sometimes it might be the minister, it might be the person in charge, but a lot of times it isn't. How do you think a city decided to change? Do you think it's because the mayor just woke up one day and said, oh, our city needs a climate action plan? Most of the time, it's because a ton of people showed up at election events, <laughs> at city events, and said, you know, we really need a climate action plan. And then there were people who were running and said, oh, well, maybe I should run on that platform and say we need it. How does the world ever change? It's when people use their voices to call for action. That is how the world changes. So when we look at what we can do, let me go back here again, we can talk not only about why this matters to us, but about what real solutions look like. Solutions that help systems and communities like greening urban neighborhoods to filter the air and provide a canopy during extreme heat waves and absorb floodwaters. Oh, and take up carbon too. Low income city neighborhoods in the US can be up to 15 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than high income neighborhoods in the same city during a heat wave due to lack of green space. There are huge nature based solutions that we can implement right here where we live that make a difference for people's lives today, the quality of their health and the safety of their homes, as well as for the climate tomorrow. Restoring coastal mangroves provide habitat for fish, provide firewood for low income communities who live along there, protect coastlines from storm surge, which is getting stronger as climate changes. Oh, and they take up carbon too. Investing in sustainable drought resilient agriculture helps people grow more food today, but makes them more climate resilient and properly managed can take up carbon too. You see where I'm going with this. We've got these win-win-win solutions, reducing the energy we waste and the food we waste. Through efficiency alone, the US could cut its carbon emissions in half and save money. This is amazing news that people would like to know. A great way to start conversations is, did you know? Converting the whole US power grid to 80% clean energy by 2030, which is in eight years, would avoid $1.7 trillion in health costs and other damages. Who doesn't want to save money? We can talk about climate solutions that give us cleaner air and cleaner water, that protect us from disasters like storms, wildfires, and floods, that improve people's physical and mental health, that provide more affordable energy, not less, that reduce our gender, racial, and socioeconomic inequalities that create healthy ecosystems and food systems and that give us a stable world and, oh, they help with climate change too. Who's on board? Well, it turns out that there are countries on board. Yeah, entire countries. There are mothers on board. There are young evangelical activists on board. There are senior citizens on board and grandparents on board. There are eight-year-old kids on board doing podcasts on YouTube. There's all kinds of faith-based groups on board all across the world. There's universities on board. There's seminaries on board. There's companies on board, some big companies whose names you've heard. There's lots of cities on board all across the US and all across the world. When we look at who's on board, there are millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of hands on that boulder pushing it down the hill. And you know what? The science is very clear that our choices matter. This is what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says. Every action matters. Every bit of warming matters. Every year matters. Every choice matters. But how do we as individuals magnify the impact of our choices by using our voice to talk about why it matters and about what we can do together to fix it. Because we are all part of something that is bigger than ourselves. We all live somewhere. We might work somewhere. We might worship somewhere. We might study somewhere. We might be part of a group of people who walk their dogs together or play hockey together or a wine club that meets together or who kayak or bird together. 
when we talk to people, we need to communicate not a false hope that says, oh, you know, everything will be okay. No, it won't be okay unless we add our hands to that boulder, as many of us as possible, as soon as possible. And so when I talk to people, I try to communicate real hope that begins with what? With recognizing it's bad. It is bad. It is an entirely rational, logical response to be discouraged, to be anxious, to be worried. It accepts that success is not inevitable. If we do nothing, we are not going to save everything we can. But there is a better future possible. And how does that, how do we get to that better future? By adding our hand, but not just our hand alone, but by using our voice to share with everyone around us why it matters and what we together can do to fix it. In the words of Greta Thunberg, the one thing we need more than hope is action, because once we start to act, hope is everywhere. When she found out about climate change, about how serious it was from Johan Rockström, one of my colleagues, a scientist in Sweden, she convinced her family to stop flying. She convinced her family to adopt a plant-based diet. And all of those are good things to do. But if that was all they had done, would she have had the impact that she's having today? No. What did she do? She did one more thing. She took a small piece of white cardboard and she painted some words on it, which were school strike for climate. And she went and she sat outside a building, which was the Swedish parliament. She used her voice and that is how a young woman is changing the world. And if she can do it, can't we? So how do we have these tough conversations in a world that is more politically divided than any time since the civil war? That is the last time when the United States has been this politically divided and climate change is at the top of some of the most politically polarized issues in the country. It has been there for 15 years. Here's the secret. What if we begin with what we have in common rather than what divides us? What if we begin by bonding over something that we share, something we both already care about, something that's affected by climate change? And then what if we connect the dots to how climate change is affecting what we both care about? How do we do this? Well, I'm gonna do my inventory and then I'm gonna ask you to do yours, all right? So get ready. I start with who I am. So I'm a scientist. So obviously if people love science, I can start with a shared love of science. I'm from Canada, so I can talk about what's happening in Canada. I live in Texas, so I can definitely talk about how Texas is the most vulnerable state in the country with the hurricanes, the floods, the heat waves, and the droughts. I love winter sports, which require snow. I'm a mother, so I teamed up with a number of my other mom, science moms to create an organization called sciencemoms.com that's aimed to empower mothers to use their voice, and I am a Christian. So when I talk with people, I often begin by using something that we have in common. I've begun conversations with the fact that I love a beach vacation and they do. I like a good bottle of wine and they do, and that's affected by climate change. I like really good chocolate and that is also being affected by climate change, not to mention hockey. I can't run for president Elaine because I am Canadian, but thank you. Uh, so here's the thing though. If you've read my book, you know that after I've been giving a talk and this has happened multiple times, I had a fellow scientist come up to me and say, you know, I really appreciate how you've been reaching out to faith-based communities and I've been trying to do that too, but I can't get my foot in the door. So how would you recommend I get in? And in each case, and again, this has happened multiple times, in each case I said, well, begin with the community that you are part of. So are you Protestant or Catholic? Are you Buddhist? Are you, you know, Jewish? And each time the scientist said to me, oh no, I'm atheist. So I said, stop, that's not the community for you. Somebody else, because there's many of us, somebody else will reach out to that community. You need to start with what you care about. So, so with, with many of these people, and with, I'll give you an example I give in the book, with one scientist, I said, well, so, you know, are you a member of the Rotary Club? No. Are you part of any community groups? No. Do you enjoy, you know, birding or kayaking? No. Do you, you know, do you have children? No. <laughs> do you have a dog? No. So I sort of went through as many things as I could think of, you know, are you really into gardening? Have you run for local office? Are you involved in? No, no, no. So finally he said, um, well, I dive, 
And I said, oh, you dive? And he said, well, yes, actually, I have some records for some very deep dives. And as he warmed to his theme, I realized this man was a very serious diver. And I said, don't you think divers need to know about climate change? I mean, the ocean is being affected even more than what's happening on land. 93% of the extra heat being trapped by this blanket we're wrapping around the planet is going into the ocean. Don't you think divers need to know that? What if you contacted your local PADI certification programs and offered to give them a free module on climate change? What if you had a group for divers and maybe you could even do some citizen science, helping them track the species that they saw in the places where you dive and how those are changing? Scientists could use that information. So each of us is unique. And now I'm going to ask you to go back to Poll Everywhere, P-O-L-L-E-V.com slash Catherine. That link was in the chat again. And I want you to give me one word, but this is a different word. I want you to give me one word about who you are. And I don't wanna see the same word here. I wanna see all different words. I care about climate change because I am a what? Now it is true that we are all human, but you also care because you might be a grandfather. I'm not a grandfather, but you are, and you can speak to other people who are grandparents. You might care because you sail. Oh, I'm actually a sailor too. And that's a great place to start a conversation. You might care because you're a scout, a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout. That's a fantastic place to start a conversation. I was talking to a woman a little while ago who was sharing with me how she lived a very, very climate friendly life. Electric car, solar panels, plant-based diet, you know, limited travel. You know, she did everything she could. But it wasn't until she read my book that she realized she was missing the accelerator. She was missing the multiplier. She wasn't talking to people about climate change. And she realized, I'm a passionate gardener. I talk to all my friends about gardening all the time. We have a very tight-knit gardening club, and I practice regenerative agricultural practices in my gardening. I've never talked to people about the fact that I care about climate change because I'm a gardener. And all of a sudden, it was like a key just unlocking her ability to connect to other people over something that she was passionate about and shared. And so I love seeing the variety here. This is phenomenal. I love seeing that people care because they're a biologist or because they're a gardener. Oh, I see that right there. Because they are um, a grandparent or a parent, an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, or a child. Care about it because they hike or because they teach or because they swim or because they love good food. <laughs> I love that we have all these different reasons here. And these are the ways that you can start a conversation with other people who share these with you. So we're almost at the end here. And I want to remind you that as we've been going along, you've been putting your questions here in Poll EV. And I love that we've already, you've already been helping me out. We already have a bunch that are upvoted. So you have about one or two more minutes to put questions in here or to upvote the ones that you most want upvoted. And then we're gonna start taking your questions. So one or two more minutes here as I finish my talk and then we're gonna go to these questions, all right? So here's the magic formula for our conversations. Begin with something that you share and if you don't know what it is, ask and listen. Now on rare occasion, you might not find something you have in common. And if you don't, that's okay. Somebody else can find that with them. Move on. Bond, connect, and then inspire. Do not end the conversation. In fact, if you only have one thing to say, skip right to step three. Do not end the conversation without talking about something. Either it could be something you did that they could do. It could be something your city is doing that's encouraging. It could be something that a school is doing or your church is doing or a business is doing or something that they're doing over there that we could do over here. Talk about something that is a positive, constructive solution to instill efficacy, to help people see that that boulder is rolling down the hill in the right direction, and it'll go faster if they add their hand. And with me, as a person of faith, the way I think about it is this. The only thing, as it says in the book of Galatians, it says the only thing that counts is when our faith expresses itself through love. So when we talk to people, and this is really important, so often we have a tendency to shame people, to judge people, to guilt people, to play the zero sum game at putting other people down to make ourselves feel slightly better. That is not love. And you know, you can feel it when somebody comes at you with a judgy finger, right? 
And what does it make you want to do? Well, with me, it just makes me want to go away and keep doing the thing I'm doing where they can't see me. So whatever our interactions with people, whatever our conversations with people, always think, how can I be expressing love? Love for this person, love for our community, and love for all the diversity of life on this incredible planet that we live on and that we share with every other living thing. So when climate changes and we get worried, what do you do? Quiz time. What do you do when climate changes and you get worried? Do you load up all the scary facts about Antarctica and the polar bears? No. You share two things, how it affects something you both care about, gardening, diving, hiking, your grandchildren, the place you live, and what a positive constructive solution looks like. And what happens? People feel empowered and action results. Why? Because that's the way our brains are wired. Going back to the neuroscience, the human brain is built to associate forward action with a reward, not with avoiding harm. So reframe your message so the information you provide induces hope, not dread. And how do you do that? by connecting the head to the heart, to the hands. Head, heart, hands. That, as I saw the first question was, that is how we spread hope. Does it really work? Well, it turns out we did an experiment that showed that it did. When you start conversations or even one minute videos with things that people care about, like free market values or national security, the Yale researchers tested the impact of short videos where we started with, with um, issues that Republicans cared about and connected the dots to why climate change affected them and what climate solutions look like. There were significant changes in people's opinions, literally from a one minute video. But you know what? There's one person who's a much better messenger than a scientist. You know who that is? It's you. People we know are more effective messengers than scientists. People we know, friends, family, acquaintances, colleagues are the most effective messengers. So when you have that conversation, begin with something you have in common, connect the dots, bring in a positive constructive solution, and remember that the goal of the conversation again is love. So that's why when I wrote a book, I called my book, Not Saving the Planet, I called it Saving Us because it really is about saving all of us together and every other living thing that shares this home with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Did you want me picking from that poly V list, Christina? Um, you can go in order or you can sort of pick a few that kind of go together, whatever you prefer. And thank you everybody for all the kind hearts. That's awesome. Yes, and, and thank you, Dr. Hayho. Uh, what an encouraging and important message. Uh, and so, Thank you for using the poll EV. I've been watching uh, throughout the talk and one of them really stood out to me. It's a little further down the list, but bear with me. Um, my church's mission team supports a different mission every month, uh, e.g. UMCOR's disaster response to help people affected by flooding in Kentucky, for example. But it feels like we're always chasing the latest disaster. So what project should we support that might make a difference in reversing climate change. So focusing on, you know, an actual thing we can do to help the bigger issue, not just disaster relief. I love that question. And I think if you talk to someone at FEMA, they would probably feel exactly the same way. <laughs> they would be like, we're just chasing disasters. Whereas we know research has shown that for every dollar that you invest in resilience, which could be greening low income neighborhoods, it could be building flood control, it could be drought resistant, sustainable agriculture, for every dollar we spend in building resilience, we save between six to $15 minimum in direct disaster recovery costs. So even from the perspective of where your dollar is best spent, they are best spent on resilience. So there are so many amazing faith-based organizations and community, local community organizations that you can invest both your money and even your hands in. And that's a great way to get people involved. So again, whether it's you know in cities, greening low-income neighborhoods with green spaces that provide places for people to take their kids as well as filtering air, providing flood control and take, uh, providing a canopy during a heat wave, or investing in um, organizations that 
there are many, many, many organizations, starting with World Vision, which probably most people have heard of, and then on down, that understand that if we don't fix climate change, we can't fix anything else. And so I've been talking to organizations like Compassion International about hiring climate scientists to start to do climate resilient work. Um, I know that the organization that I use to, um, to cover my personal carbon offsets, Climate Stewards, is a faith-based organization that invests in low-income countries to help them with sustainable sources of energy, as well as maintaining the ecosystems that provide their water and their food and their firewood. Um, there's so many really good organizations, and I would strongly recommend looking at organizations that either help people build resilience or help bring energy to low-income communities and countries. Like in my book, I talk about Solar Sister that empowers women in Sub-Saharan Africa through selling solar technology in places where they don't have any other form of electricity except maybe really expensive kerosene. So I completely agree and I love that question. Do a bit of digging. There's so many organizations out there. Focus on organizations that either specifically focus on um, things like sanitation, agriculture, water, safe housing, empowering women and girls, because that is a climate solution too. And ones that also look at clean energy in low income communities right here in the US, as well as in other countries around the world. And those are fantastic and phenomenal places to invest your money where it won't be chasing every disaster. Because if we keep just chasing disasters, we can't keep up. No, thank you. So here's another question. Given that we are in an important election season um, and that I'm a policy coordinator at heart, um, how do we make climate inaction among our political leaders unacceptable? That is a great question. And my answer is going to be what you might suspect it is. We have to use our voice. But we have to use our voice not to say, why aren't you taking climate action because of the polar bears and the Antarctic ice sheet? We have to say, why aren't you taking action because of the wildfire we just had the next county over? Or because of the hurricane that flooded so many homes that were still trying to repair themselves while the next hurricane came in. We have to make it local. We have to do our homework. We have to say, this is what happened where we live. And unfortunately, we can have examples everywhere now. It's no longer rare. The rarity is not having examples. And here's another key, bring in examples of positive solutions. Like say, look at the city of Houston. It's home to the oil and gas industry. Yet it has one of the most progressive climate action plans in the country. Why are we letting Houston beat us? <laughs> bring in, you know, look at that county over there. They have this policy for clean energy. Look at all the jobs they have. Why aren't we doing that for jobs? There's no harm in a little competition. So do your research and find out not only how it affects you and why it matters, but also find out what the benefits of local action could be. Bring up other examples that might appeal to them and say, look at what they did over there and look at all the benefits we could have here. And you know what? I'm totally fine with not calling it climate action. In fact, the Inflation Reduction Act is, not, is the biggest climate bill ever passed by the US and it's called the Inflation Reduction Act. And I think that is a great thing to call it because who doesn't wanna reduce inflation? And the Build Back Better Act is another great title because who doesn't want to build back better? What, you want to build back worse? So <laughs> call it whatever you want to call it. But we have to realize that we can't fix any problem if we don't fix climate change. And climate action needs to be embedded into every aspect of from our planning to our water, to our food, to our infrastructure, to our economy, to our energy, to every circle that we're part of. Our lives, our places of worship, our places of work, our schools everywhere we are using our voice to advocate for those changes is the way we change the system. Thank you. So I'm looking at the poll EV and the very top question I think um, gets at the fact that this is all very complicated and many of us want to help, we don't want to do harm, but are maybe a little bit worried about how some of the solutions to the climate crisis might actually do harm to some communities. And so, um, the question says, can you speak to the hidden challenges of um, green energies? And you know, how can we be aware of you know, not doing harm to communities when we're trying to help? Well, the way you phrased the question was slightly different. And I like that a lot. Um, let me speak very briefly though to a myth I hear so frequently that I have a Twitter thread about this myth. And I put the Twitter thread in the chat right there. There's a myth that is a very harmful myth and it goes like this. There's some way to get free energy with no impacts whatsoever of any kind. 
And until we can find that magical form of completely impact free energy, let's just go with the status quo. You know, oh, electric cars, too much of a problem, you know, rare earth minerals. Did you know that regular cars also use rare earth minerals, but we don't hear a lot about that, do we? So could we do better? Of course. Do we need to do better? Absolutely. Are there massive concerns with human rights violations and mining rare earth minerals in the Congo, for example? Yes. If we don't fix climate change, we will not have a civilization left. We need to do everything we can to transition our fossil fuels as quickly as we can and invest in nature and let nature help us because up to a third of our carbon could be taken away from investing in nature. We need to look for win-win-wins that empower local communities and indigenous peoples. Indigenous land management is actually a key climate solution and a biodiversity solution as well. We need to look for solutions that improve our air quality because the 10 million people who die from breathing pollution from fossil fuels, guess who those predominantly are, predominantly people living in low income neighborhoods and low income countries. We need to invest in empowering people like, like I said, uh, education of women and girls in low income countries is a climate solution. We need to look for the win win wins that clean up our air, clean up our water, provide even more affordable energy to people who don't have it or can't afford it, address inequalities, invest and restore nature. Oh, and they help with climate change too. We don't have time and we have to do as much as we can with as many wins as we can. And unfortunately, I have often seen the perfect getting in the way of the good. Yeah. Another really popular question is, you know, how do we get more companies that are producing waste and, and you know, using fossil fuels on board with climate action? We know we can't just personal change our way out of this crisis, but, you know, how do we put pressure on companies? That is a great question. And there are multiple ways that you can do so. And here's the good news. That giant boulder is already rolling down the hill. Believe me, companies are getting the memo. How are they getting that memo? Okay, so first of all, the general public. I actually make a practice of if there's you know, a product that I use that I'm concerned about is I reach out to them in some way. I call them or I send something on Twitter or I send a message on the help site saying, you know, have you thought about this or I'm not using you anymore because of this. So using your voice as a consumer is important. Um, speaking with your money in terms of what you do or do not purchase is important. Speaking with your investments, if you have retirement funds or pension funds, I love it because um, after reading my book, one woman actually decided she was a retiree and she said, the biggest thing I can do is look at where my pension funds are invested. So she called up her pension fund manager and she said, you know, I want to make sure that I'm not invested in any of these companies that are either, you know, producing or selling fossil fuels or investing in fossil fuel exploration. And her pension manager said, I've never heard anybody say that to me before. I don't think we can do that. And she said, oh, yes, you can. <laughs> and you better find out how. So that's one way. But then there's another way. And again, these are all different depending on who you are. What if you work at one of those companies? Why do you think Amazon has such an amazing climate action plan? They actually do. It's really incredible what they're doing. I was just reading their 167 page climate action plan the other day. And I was like, whoa, it was not because Jeff Bezos rolled out of bed one morning and decided we need a climate action plan. There were people who used their voices to say, we need this in every company, in the Apples and the Microsofts, in the Walmarts of the world. And then there's stakeholders and shareholders like engine number one, look up that engine number one bought enough shares in Exxon so they could show up for the annual shareholders meeting and try to gather enough votes to force Exxon to actually have a climate plan. So there's so many different ways that we can use our voice, but it always begins with just having that conversation in the sphere where we are to say, this is why it matters. And hey, what do you think about trying to do this together? Outstanding. Let's end on, I think, one of the most common questions that I saw in a variety of different ways in the uh, poll EV. How do you and your children stay hopeful? Well, I will tell you that most of the media these days is focused on doom, despair, fear, anxiety, frustration. Why? Because that gets the clicks. Most of our media these days is for profit media. If you go to BBC or CBC in Canada, you'll see the difference. Their headlines seem kind of dry 
almost boring. <laughs> but if you go to a lot of the websites, I actually conducted an experiment a little while ago. I went to the CNN website and I counted 35 headlines. Out of those 35 headlines, about seven were neutral, like they didn't invoke an emotion in you. And the rest of them were all headlines designed to make you feel anxious, worried, angry, frustrated, annoyed, negative emotions. So when all of this negative stuff is coming in at us, we have to take action deliberately to look for hope. So I practice hope. Um, Joanna Macy has written a wonderful book about active hope. And it's the concept of you practice it. And the more you practice that, the better you get. How do you practice hope? I look for positive information. I share positive information. In my newsletter, which you can get on my website, which is just my name, katherinehayhoe.com. I'll put it in here. Com. There we go. In my newsletter, every single week, I share a piece of good news, a piece of not so good news because it's bad, and a piece of what you can do to help. And I even color code them. I color code them green, red, and blue. So if you want to skip the red, you can. <laughs> but if you want a piece of hopeful news every single week, that is what my newsletter does. And what do you do with that hope? Tell other people about it. Have conversations with other people. When we engage with others and act together with others, that is where we find hope. It isn't the hope comes first, the action comes second. It's the action comes first, the hope comes second. Well, uh, that is a great note to leave off on, I think. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Hayhoe, uh, for joining us this evening and for everyone here who is working to address climate justice and climate change around the world. Thank you. So we are now, and I see all the hearts and the love in the, is that the chat? What is that? <laughs> we, <laughs> keep it coming. We are now going to celebrate some of the incredible work that our community is doing across the Midwest. Uh, during our awards ceremonies. So please sit back and enjoy the inspiring work of our community. Good evening, everyone. My name is Reverend Veronica Johnson, and I'm the Outreach Director for Faith in Place. I'm excited to be announcing the Green Team Award winner for the Chicago region, which is my home region. This Green Team, through a combination of decarbonization efforts, has achieved net zero carbon emissions and is committed to helping others to do the same. To honor all of the amazing work, I'm very excited to announce that Euclid Avenue United Methodist Church of Oak Park, Illinois is the Green Team Award winner for the Chicago region. Congratulations, Euclid Avenue. I'm so proud of all of the work that you've done, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Wade Halva and I'm the Southern Illinois Outreach Coordinator for Faith in Place. I'm very excited to be announcing the winner of the Green Team Award for Southern Illinois. This Green Team has started to assess their property, to begin making an overall plan for the property, for water runoff, tree planting, and beautification, as well as space for the growing community garden that is a partnership with many in the community donating over 500 pounds of fresh, nutritious food to those in need in the community this year. To honor all of this amazing work, I'm very excited to announce that First Presbyterian of Marion is the Green Team Award winner for Southern Illinois. Congratulations, First Pres. I'm so proud of all the work you have done and look forward to seeing the fruits of these labors in the future.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Carla Aldana, and I'm the Northern Illinois Bilingual Outreach Coordinator for Faith in Place. And I'm very excited to be announcing the Green Team Award winner for Northern Illinois. This team are leaders in the Laudato Si movement. The Laudato Si Action Platform embraces including all ministries of the parish, as well as community members, in order to care for our common home. They hold a wide range of activities, from helping at the food pantry, to including creation care and worship services, as well as educating the community of all ages about the importance of environmental care. I'm so happy to be announcing that St. Anne Catholic Community of Barrington, Illinois are this year's Green Team Award winners for Northern Illinois. Congratulations, St. Anne. I am so proud of all of the work that you've done, and I look forward to working with you in this coming year. Good evening, everyone. My name is Alexander Melko. I am the Wisconsin Policy Coordinator for Faith in Place and a Green Team Coach. I'm excited to announce Wisconsin's very first Green Team Award winner. 10 years ago, this team laid its foundations in a project to reduce their House of Worship's carbon footprint and energy bills. Since then, they have built a legacy by gardening, joining with their youth to advocate for climate action and educating the congregation, empowering individual and family commitments that protect God's gift of creation. I am very excited to present the First Methodist Church of Madison with this recognition from Faith in Place. Congratulations, First Methodist. Happy 10th anniversary. I'm proud to know you and look forward to the great work you will do in your next 10 years of stewardship and love for the earth. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jalisa Mullen, and I am the Indiana Outreach Coordinator here at Faith in Place. And I am so excited to be announcing the very first winner of the Green Team Award for my home region, Indiana. And we are celebrating the Progressive Community Church of Gary as our Green Team of 2022. This green team has exemplified all that it means to be stewards. They have created an organic farm and orchard. They have worked with 25 children to get them certified as junior master gardeners, and this is only the tip of the iceberg. When I first spoke with Pastor Whitaker, he told me that he is someone that thinks big. And I think of how much courage and intention it takes to not only think big, but to follow the plan and see it through. The Progressive Community Church's legacy will not only be here for themselves, but for generations to come. Congratulations, Progressive Community team. The work that you all have done is not only inspiring, but it is immensely impactful. And I look forward to all that lies ahead. Thank you so much and congratulations. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dan Huncha, and I'm the North and West Suburbs Outreach Director for Faith in Place. And I'm really excited to be announcing the Green Team of the Year winner for my region, the North and West Suburbs. This Green Team has done many exciting things over the last two years. And this year they wanted to uh, up the ante, so they started off with an energy audit, and then they started doing energy retrofit projects. And then of course they started doing some educational events for their members of their house of worship because the positive impact that the members can have is way bigger than what you can do in your building. So they um, really served as inspiration for their members of their house of worship. And then their house of worship members are now saving money and lowering their footprint at the same time. Um, they also engaged in a polyesterine recycling event. And then they really wanted to do long-term positive impact in their community and in their house of worship. So they did a four-year uh, planning session and came up with a four-year environmental plan. And then um, kind of the icing on the cake um, is they did a solar project. So they did a 30 panel solar project, which for them is phase one. And then now they're starting the planning uh, process of doing phase two, which is um, they're donating some land uh, that they have to the village and the village is going to um, construct a playground 
And then they're also gonna put in a pavilion for, uh, for a meeting space for the community. And uh, they're gonna have solar panels on the pavilion as well. Um, so they've been doing a lot of really exciting projects. So I'm really uh, excited to announce that Yorkville Congregational UCC is this year's uh, green team of the year for the North and West suburbs. I look forward to continuing to work with you um, as you uh, continue on your path to educate and inspire the members of your congregation and your community. Thanks for all the cool work you've been doing. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christina Krost, and I am the Illinois Policy Senior Coordinator at Faith in Place. But I also coach green teams in Central Illinois. And so I'm very excited to be announcing the winner of the Green Team Award for my home region this evening. This green team has been very busy. They started with a small vegetable garden project, which has expanded into something much bigger in the passing years which then led to them applying for and receiving some funds to do a natural climate solutions project, which means they'll be planting pollinators and trees uh, near their vegetable garden to help steward the land where their church sits in Charleston, Illinois. They also hosted an event this spring, which culminated in writing letters to legislators uh, to talk about the things that they care about and the shared values they have in their community. They've done an energy audit in the past two years and are now looking at doing a solar project as well. All of this while having a pastoral transition as well. So to honor all their amazing work, I'm excited to announce that Charleston Wesley United Methodist Church is our Green Team Award winner for Central Illinois. Congratulations, Charleston Wesley. I am so proud of the work that you've done and I look forward to continuing that work in the years to come. Huge congratulations to all our Green Team Award winners. Uh, definitely, I see a lot of hearts and claps going on across our amazing, amazing regions. Shout out to all of our Green Team coaches. The Faith in Place team working across Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin is coaching more than 250 active Green Teams right now. That means a Green Team that's meeting monthly, working with our local outreach staff to implement programs. And those were just a few examples of the inspiring work that's happening to advance our mission of racial and environmental justice and community. Faith in Place, as a reminder, works as the Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin affiliate of Interfaith Power and Light. If you're dialing in from another state, be sure to connect with your local Interfaith Power and Light partner so you can get your green team going and coached up and ready to do the good work that we're all doing. Now, it takes a lot of work from Faith in Place to make sure that we have the support for you all as our green teams as you enact our mission and vision in the world of a, a people of faith leading the environmental movement towards justice, people of faith taking measurable steps for racial and environmental justice. And there's folks that come alongside us as an organization that we want to take a moment to highlight right now. As Executive Director of Faith in Place, I get this honor to highlight a few donors, funders, partners, and individuals who have really stepped it up this year to make sure that our mission can be enacted, that we can partner with you as green teams to really be the world that we want to see. So first up this year is the Volunteer Organization of the Year Award. Many of you know that we've already highlighted that we actually merged together with Hoosier Interfaith Power and Light and Wisconsin Interfaith Power and Light to become one organization working across the three states. And in order to do that, we needed good legal expertise. And then the legal expertise that stepped up was the Jenner and Block legal team, who is the recipient of our Volunteer Organization of the Year Award this year. Not only does Jenner and Black support us in the merger and making sure that we have all the things uh, covered for a successful merger, but they help us with policies and procedures, personnel, making sure we do things as Faith in Place as a 501c3 accurately, correctly, as well as Faith in Place Action Fund as our 501c4. So to accept this award on behalf of Jenner and Black, I'd like to welcome Steve to the stage right now to say a few words. Steve? 
Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it really is an honor um, to even be considered for this award. When, when I look around and I see all the work that's being done every day by so many volunteers to support Faith in Place. Um, when Brian first came to me in 2017 and asked for some guidance on a solar project, and I had an opportunity to learn more about Faith in Place and everything it was accomplishing in places of worship throughout the state of Illinois, it was a no-brainer for me to gladly accept that invitation. And since then, um, Brian's been kind enough to provide Jenner and Block with numerous other opportunities to, to further support Faith in Place's activities. Um, in accepting this award, I want to acknowledge my numerous Jenner and Block colleagues that have also embraced the opportunity to work with this great organization. Uh, every time uh, Brian has reached out with a particular question or issue, it has been very easy for me to get my colleagues to jump on this and help when I talk about the great work the organization is doing in Illinois and now in Wisconsin and Indiana. I mean, it's really great. It's an awesome organization. Uh, so again, thank you so much for the award, and we look forward to continuing to serve as trusted counselors for Faith in Place. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Steve, and thank you to the Jenner and Block team, and congratulations on this award. Now, we not only have great organizations that support us as volunteers, but we also have amazing individuals who step up and support. We have so many amazing volunteers at Faith in Place, but you know, this year, we want to recognize an individual that's really helped us navigate putting solar on houses of worship. I don't need to tell you all as an audience that putting solar on your house of worship is complicated, right? You need legal expertise, you need finance expertise, you need to figure out how to take advantage of the tax credits. It's a really complicated thing. And someone that stepped up this year for us to help our staff team be the experts, be at the cutting edge of understanding everything is our individual volunteer of the award, John Delury this year. John has come to our staff meetings, helped us answer questions, make sure that we're fully equipped to serve our houses of worship, but he's also been available to help us write letters of support for grant applications and, and just be a resource for us. And so, John, I want to invite you up to receive this award and uh, invite you to say a few words. Thanks, Brian. So uh, years ago, I wandered into the Faith in Place office and lucked into a doubleheader meeting with Brian and Pastor Anque. Uh, walked out with a whole bunch of work and at least two different projects. Uh, one a project with Pastor Anque to bring solar to low-income families in Chicago, and another with Brian to try to incentivize creating new sticks and carrots for solar companies to hire returning residents and foster care alumni. Little did we know then that we were uh, planting some of the seeds that later became policy pillars for the landmark Climate and Equitable Jobs Act in Illinois, which Faith in Place was instrumental in passing. But ultimately taking aimless uh, but well-intentioned wanderers like myself and putting them to good work is a sign of a successful and powerful organization. But it's not just successful, it's not just powerful, it's different. It's one of those rare and extraordinary places where good people do great things driven by faith in a better world. The staff, leadership, by extension, volunteers like myself and so many others are in a unique position to be guided by what is right, not just what is politically expedient or popular. While my relationship has transitioned a little bit uh, from overcommitted volunteer to overcommitted partner, my dedication to faith in place has stayed resolute and my admiration of the organization remains it's probably stronger than ever. Certainly don't feel worthy uh, for this award, but will gratefully accept it on behalf of the hundreds of other volunteers who have poured their hearts and souls into the fight for climate justice alongside Faith in Place. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And back to you, Brian. Well, thank you, John. And I already see that we've sparked some questions in the chat. Well, wait, how do I get the tax advantages for putting solar up on my house of worship? Be sure to check out Faith in Place's website for more resources. Reach out to a green team coach, outreach coordinator, uh, near you. So it's not only our volunteers that make the mission of Faith in Place thrive, but it's also our donors. And so we have a couple of donor awards. First up is our Individual Donor of the Year Award. This is an individual who we've gotten to know through our merger at Faith in Place, uh, historically working in Illinois, now in Indiana and Wisconsin. We got to know this individual from Indiana who has a passion for helping houses of worship do decarbonization activities. And this individual specifically donated to make it possible for 10 houses of worship in Indiana to advance their energy efficiency and decarbonization efforts. These included things like installing solar panels, yes, 
but also putting up EV charging stations, uh, making sure that old leaky, leaky boiler was replaced, putting in new HVAC systems, new insulation, and making sure that the energy bill goes down and the carbon savings go up. And so it's my great joy to announce our individual donor of the year award. This year goes to Matt Hook. Matt, I'd like to invite you up at this time to say a few words. Good evening. Um, I just want to say how appreciative I am of faith in place and all of you for the changes you're making in the world, but especially for your efforts with respect to climate change, which is really the existential issue of our time. And I'd like to say a special thanks to the houses of worship who are taking action to reduce their greenhouse gases, because I know that they have finite resources in a world that has infinite needs. Uh, they are to, to be applauded for their recognition that failure to address this critical issue now is only going to exacerbate so many of the world's other problems. And additionally, I'd like to say a quick thanks to the, the, the younger generation whose leadership on climate change is so amazing and so humbling. And I would just beseech them to continue to lead on this critical issue because their leadership on climate change is so desperately needed. And finally, I would just leave you with the words of an old English philosopher who once said, the saddest words that were ever said were because I could do so little, I did nothing. So please continue to, to work out there for climate change. We, we desperately need it. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And thank you to all of our individual donors who make our mission possible. We appreciate you and we need you. And it's not only our individuals who donate to support Faith in Place, but we have many foundation partners who also support us. And so this year we have a Funder of the Year Award. This is going to a foundation that has funded Faith in Place for many years, but they've done more than just fund our mission. The money is important, but they've also opened up their Rolodex, introduced us to other funders in the space. They've also brought partners together to think through best practices, to brainstorm together. They've done such, so much more as a fun, funder, they become a really a true partner. And it's my great joy to announce that this year's Funder of the Year Award goes to the Illinois Science and Energy Innovation and I'd like to invite Uzma to come up to accept the award on their behalf. Uzma. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much for this honor. Year over year, Faith in Place has exceeded their goals. And I mean, if you wanna talk metrics, they just knock it out the park every year. Um, but I think what made them stand out outside of that stellar performance is that the team works in places of worship where people feel loved and accepted. And that feeling of love and a safe space is an unspoken prerequisite for education, engagement, and action. As a funder, we spent a lot of time talking about what makes a strong and effective program and wholeheartedly believe that Faith in Place's approach to creating connections between environmental engagement and faith is one of the most impactful we've seen. And they've been able to inspire people to act when they're feeling loved, included, and safe. And that's just so important to that personal journey of taking action. Over the years, we've seen Faith in Place grow, adapt, and innovate, especially during the peak COVID years. And we're proud to support your work all of these years. We appreciate all that you've done to educate people while supporting their faith journeys. Thank you for being a strong partner to ISIF and to our grantee cohort. Oh, well, thank you, Uzma. That's, that's so kind. Uh, leading with the theme of love that's that's beautiful and any metrics that we've been able to surpass is because of our amazing green teams people that are on this call um, so thank you and congratulations Uzma and Illinois Science and Energy Innovation Foundation we have one last award and I'm personally very excited to give this award uh, this is an award to an outstanding partner of the year as you've all gotten a sense, Faith in Place is in a season of growth, a season where we are seeking to expand our mission, expand the donations that come in to make that mission possible, to continue to fight the good fight for climate change, environmental justice, and racial justice. And when we do this, we have really good mentors and as partners uh, in this work, and someone that's been there before. And that's been this year, our outstanding partner of the year is Elevate. Elevate is an organization that's much larger than Faith in Place, but shares a common root and, and incubation story in that we were both born out of the Center for Neighborhood Technology here in Chicago. Elevate is having an amazing impact all across the nation, and their leadership team 
has gone out of their way as Faith of Place has grown, as we've gone through a merger, to spend time with us, to talk to us about best policies and procedures, ways to grow an organization that prioritizes your mission first and your, puts your staff at the forefront. And it's such a delight for me to welcome up to the stage to accept this award, Delmar, congratulations for Elevate receiving the Faith in Place Partner of the Year Award. Delmar? Thank you, Reverend Brian. Um, it is indeed a great honor. And on behalf of the Elevate team and our CEO, Ann Evans, um, we want to thank you uh, humbly for this award and this recognition. Uh, to elevate a true partnership is when both organizations are able to grow, expand our reach, and really do more for the communities that we love, respect, and support. And from Elevate's perspective, Reverend Brian, whether it's working late nights at the Capitol with Pastor Onkwe on CJA, or working with your team on operational best practices and sharing things that work, or working with the Illinois Environmental Council on budgets and planning to strengthen that organization. Uh, we have always had a very tight relationship with you and your team. And so although you are awarding us this great honor, um, I just really want to thank uh, um, Faith in Place for all that you've done for us to continue to help nourish our organization. And we're really looking forward to continuing this partnership uh, well into the future. And so once again, Reverend Brian, we just want to thank Faith in Place. Thank you. Thank you and your leadership team, as well as all of the great team members in your organization for this great honor and recognition. Well, thank you, Del Mar, and congratulations, Elevate, and your whole team. Really appreciate you. And let me just say a word of thanks for each of you, all of you who are joining tonight. Thank you for joining. Wasn't Dr. Heho so inspirational? Uh, what she set up, this is, is beautiful for us to follow as we go forward, working as green teams, starting green teams, taking our green teams to a new level, uh, coming together as a network of powerful grassroots advocates, lifting up our voices of faith, lifting up what is important to us in our place to make this mission possible and to create the world that we all long to see. So thank you to all of you. Before we wrap up, though, I want to welcome Christina to come back up to the stage Christina is going to share resources we have free of cost for those looking for ways to learn more and to take action for climate justice. So Christina, take us home. Thank you, Brian. So Faith in Place has lots of resources available for you to continue learning about environmental justice, connect with others, and to find practical ways to take action. And like we heard uh, Dr. Hayho tell us, you know, working together with these faith communities, practicing hope, is critical to making a difference in the climate crisis. And this is, that's just what our resources and our green team coaches can help you do. We will link a document in the chat and in this session's description that will share ideas of some ways to get started from free curricula to our podcast to a, week, a monthly call with local staff ready to connect and support you. We have a wealth of resources and tips ready and waiting for you. I also want to share about Faith in Place's green teams. As you saw in our award videos, we support green teams, which are small groups of people at houses of worship in Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin. These green teams work with coaches and our staff who are trained to support and connect green teams with resources and program areas of interest to them from creating community gardens at your house of worship to installing solar panels. We have a wide array of programs and we would love to connect you. If you're interested in starting a green team or learning more about Faith in Place, please join us tomorrow for session two at 1130 Central Time, 1230 Eastern Time to hear about our programs from our amazing staff team and on Wednesday evening for our networking session on getting started. I'm now going to turn it over to Liz Ferguson, Faith in Place's Development Coordinator, to share some closing words and to highlight what's coming up tomorrow. Liz? Thank you, Christina, and good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Ferguson, and I want to say a big thank you to each of you for joining tonight and all to all of our welcome party hosts welcoming in-person viewings of tonight's session. As we close for the night, I want to highlight a closing message from Dr. Hayho's book, where she shares a quote from Active Hope, how to face the mess we're in without going crazy. Active hope is a practice. 
like Tai Chi or gardening, it is something we do rather than have. First, we take in a clear view of reality. Second, we identify what we hope for. And third, we take steps to move ourselves or our attention in that direction. Rather than weighing our change and proceeding only when we feel hopeful, we focus on our intention and let that be our guide. Dr. Hayhoe shared ways to connect with those around us and share our stories as a way to act and to move towards hope. I invite each of you to join me in this practice as we go forward from tonight. I also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors and donors before we close. We are so grateful for Natural Resources Defense Council, our headline sponsor, and ComEd, an excellent company, our, ses our session sponsor, as well as the Congregation of St. Joseph, Create More Karma Foundation, Gajero and Tolly, and the Illinois Environmental Council. I hope to see you all tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. Central Time, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time for session two, DJs, milkweed, jams, and more. Get to know Faith in Place. Our team will be sharing about their programs and we will have lots of chances to win gift cards, so you'll definitely want to be there. And tomorrow evening, we will welcome leaders of seven faith traditions to share practices and reflections on environmental care and justice. Be sure to join us for that session as well, starting at 6.30 p.m. Central Time, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you again for joining and to Dr. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe for such an inspiring keynote. I hope you all have a lovely rest of your Sunday.